Hello everyone, my name is Hugo and welcome to Hugo's Desk. So this week we are going to continue with part 2 of Hugo Disk Constructs Rival Kingdoms Compositing. But before we go into the video, I just wanted to thank the gigantic support I've been getting, uh, both from comments on YouTube, I've been getting some really great messages on Twitter, on my private email. I just am overwhelmed by the support and by all the kind words that I've been getting on all these messages. Thank you so much for supporting me, and as always, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hopefully I will be sharing even more and more videos in the very near future. So thank you so much. So let's just go into the video right away and uh, continue the disconstruction of this composite. Then I end up having the torches. Now the torches is a completely separate thing. So I have to kind of go through this and kind of explain to you. As you can see, we had torches uh, all over the place on this uh, comp. The reason I use this methodology uh, was because we tended to... Uh, I'm going to just disable this sharp and I'll explain to you why this is, is there in a minute. And I'm also going to disable the glows um, so that I can have only the uh, torches. Now, the torches are using the 3D system of Nuke. Now, the reason I did this was because I really didn't have um, a large team, like I explained on this project, and we couldn't really afford to have a lot of dynamics or a lot of fire elements. So I tended to do what I do, which is to find 2D elements. And that's what I did. I'm just going to enable all of this here, and I'm going to show you really quickly what I what I what I mean so these are basically um, fire fire clips and these are actually fire clips um, remarkably done in red camera I didn't go and film these at all I can tell you that um, I did not I wish I had but I didn't so that's why they're so heavy to play back so they're all 3k 4k uh, torch fires um, if you guys don't know, uh, you should know that there is a, the re a remarkable company uh, called F FX Elements. I'm going to show you really quickly here. They have something remarkable, which is their stock footage. I know it sounds expensive because they are asking for $400 for the stock footage. But think about this. Every single clip on this stock footage is a red camera stock footage. And that's what these fires are. It's not uh, quick times. It's not H264s. It's not stupid MP, MPEGs or ProReses or whatever the fuck they do these days. It is actual red files, you know, with all the metadata of the red file. As you can see here, you can even see every single element like the ISOs and the Kelvins and the actual color space of the red camera. So these are just unviolable because they, they have so much dynamic range. The entire thing has so much dynamic range that you can still f-stop down and have all the detail of the fire. And that's what you want. You want footage and elements that are done like this, that are done professionally so that you have dynamic range. And so I cannot recommend enough for you guys to just, as soon as you watch this video, Go into this website, it's called effectselements.com, and buy these elements. They are just amazing, amazing quality, and I have to hand over to FX Elements team the astonishing job that they've made. As far as I know, I've never seen um, you know another company selling actual red footage. And it's really silly, because if you think about it, Every single stock footage that was done in the world has been shot somewhere, right? I mean, it has to have been shot because it was shot with a camera. So where the hell are the raw files? Where are they? Well, these guys were clever enough to keep the raw files so that everyone can use them. And, um, and that's great. I really think that's great. So going back to the comp, I'm sorry, again, I say I always talk too much. What I did here was I selected a bunch of torches um, and then using... The position pass, and for those of you that don't know what the position pass is, um, position pass uses the normals passes, the position pass, and the color pass. So basically I'm using my raw, like my raw pass, and um, I'm then using my position pass, which is basically the coordinates of the CG scene, and then I have my normals pass, um, and that all together combine on something called the position pass gives me this it gives me basically a point cloud system you guys probably seen this many many times on tutorials um in the foundry but this is remarkable um and it's really handy because this allows you to know 
specifically where objects are in 3D. And I mean really specific. I mean, it's like one to one. Everything here is into scale. So if I open this scene in Maya right now, it would be exactly the same scale, the same position, the same location as in Maya, which is really good because then if you actually know a little 3D, you can actually open the 3D scene and bring some geometry if you need to, and it will be placed on the correct place. And so this is how we figured to put the torches because I knew exactly where the torch and where the fire should be because you can see the redness of the points here. So I knew that every fire needed to be on each of these pillars so that I had, you know, one, two, three pillars. And some pillars were turned off because that was, you know, a creative decision of us. Um, so, and that was cool because um, that meant that um, we could actually place real elements instead of actually wasting time doing a lot of simulations and doing, in, you all know how long simulations take, especially in simulations in 3D. Um, so, you know, that was cool. I think that was a really nice way. Of course, None of this is anything if you don't have the camera. So you do have to have the camera as well. Um, and so don't don't forget that. Um, I'm just going to make a really quick uh, little change here so that I can show you just the camera with the scene. So this camera, of course, was exported uh, from Maya. So that's how we did the fire. So the fire is basically just a bunch of elements from FX elements. Uh, they are, of course, processed in Kronos because I want them to be a bit slower because they, they needed to be bit in slow motion and then of course I have a bunch of um, you know color correction uh, built into them um, so that they have a more contrasted look so this color corrector is nothing more than just a multiply and a gamma so that we have a bit of a more contrasting feeling and I've done that to all of them so and then I just place them in 3d cards um, so you know there we hold here's the little torch um, and if you look at it the whole thing together that's how it looks. You have basically have your pillars um, and then you have your fire elements, uh, which are nothing more than 2D fire elements, all in the correct uh, places. Um, and of course, this means that I don't have to track anything. I don't have to actually uh, do any kind of transformations because because I have the camera, it will all move automatically. Uh, now, this is extremely heavy in 2D, of course, um, and because of that, I did decide to render it out. Um, it's just too heavy. You see how slow it is? The reason that this is so slow is not because it's 3D. It's more half, it has more to do because it's red footage, because red footage is really heavy, and also it's all 4K footage. Has a, you know, it's really, really heavy. Also, I have a lot of Kronos effects, uh, which Kronos is very slow as well. So I did make the option of doing a bit of a pre-render. And, you know, I did the pre-render in EXR with all the channels. The reason I did all the channels in EXR linear was because I did want to keep as much detail as possible. So this is the final render. And this is the actual render with all the passes. So it does include motion vectors. It includes forwards. It includes alpha channel. It includes the depth pass. It includes everything you need. And also, because it's an EXR, it's a pre-render that includes also dynamic range on the fire. And that's always where, uh, when you do to the elements from experience, you always think, oh, shit, to the elements is not going to work on this comp because there's no dynamic range. Well, think again, because there is dynamic range on these elements because they are red footage. I render them out so that I have a bit more control, and that's the pass. And now, now that it's rendered, uh, what I usually do is I just disable all of this crap um, and I just use the rendered. And of course, if I need to change it, just go back and render it again. That's fine. So after we've done that, after we actually done all this fire, uh, what I ended up doing here as well um, is I merge them on top, of course, um, as a plus, as you do. Uh, you put the fire uh, together uh, on the place. And of course, you know, it doesn't really line up perfectly, but it doesn't really matter. You don't really see it, really. Um, after that, um, we tend to do, um, you know, I tend to always do the depth pass and the velocity pass, the motion blur in comp. The reason I do it in comp and not in 3D, of course, it, it there is exceptions. I always try defocusing the depth of field and the motion blur in composite. The reason I try to do it in compositing is because I want to have control over it. You know, I want to try to put more or less 
sometimes even animate the motion blur, sometimes even animate the Z depth um, and animate the depth of field. That's just because for me it's a natural thing because I'm, you know, a photographer so and I'm a 2D artist by trade. So I tend to want to control those things. And of course, if you render them in 3D, you might get something more perfect, but you won't be able to change it. It will be forever defocused or motion blurred. So I tend to prefer to control it myself. Of course, I know this is a long, long, long argument with 3D artists. I used to have these arguments all the time at the mill. Uh, oh, why don't we just render it in 3D? Well, yes, we can render it in 3D. And a lot of times it does give you better results. So it kind of depends. Um, certain things become better in 3D if you render them in 3D. But it's just too expensive. It takes too long to render. And I couldn't really afford that. This is a production done, uh, you know, by my own team. It's I don't have a big company like The Mill. I have a much more, uh, you know, smaller uh, crew. So I can't really afford to do those kind of things like we used to do at The Mill, which is to just send things to the farm and hope for the best. I can't really do that anymore. So with that in mind, I control it. Now, I always do the same same thing whenever I do depth passes. I always shuffle it out and I tend to try to ask my CG artist to give me a raw depth pass, meaning that if it was raw, you wouldn't have seen anything here. You would have just seen white. But, you know, tends to be difficult sometimes to get the raw depth pass if you don't um, put all the correct values into it. So, in this situation, we don't have a raw depth pass, but we do have a very high dynamic range pass. Because as you can see here, if I lower my um, f-stop, you can see that I have a huge range because it's a 32-bit float depth pass. The first thing I do is a grade node, and the grade node is basically nothing more than black point, white point. This is very simple you try to pick up the black point from what's furthest from the screen and you try to pick up the white point from what's closest to the screen. If you do that, then that means that you'll get a basically filtered image. You'll basically get a graded image where the black point is neutral. It's actually black and the white is actually white. So that's why we do it that way. I then use the color edge. Now the color edge is a gizmo uh, very similar to the edge extend, sorry. So these two nodes do the same thing roughly, and they are both from Nukipedia. So if you can, go to Nukipedia and download them. They are very good, and they will save your ass most of the time when you're working with that passes. The reason I'm doing the color edge or the edge extend is because I do want to extend my edges as much as I can. The reason for that is because normally, if I look at my RGB, you can see that if I look at these are the edges of my alpha channel and these are the edges of my depth passes and you see it, it doesn't match. So the central pixel of the edge of my geometry is actually the central pixel of my alpha, which means that that pixel is not included on my depth uh, pass. You see it's missing. And this is, of course, going to give me horrible artifacts when I do depth passes or when I do depth of field. So to avoid this, using the color edge will basically extend those pixels forever. So what the color edge does is to basically allow you to grow those pixels from the last pixel and it just repeats the pixel forever. Of course, it does a bit more than that, but it is uh, a remarkable node, uh, especially uh, used um, not just for depth fixing, um, but it's mostly done, these nodes, mostly uh, for uh, keying and mostly for green screen keying when you want to fix edges or you want to fix the hair. That's how we usually tend to use them. So that's how, that's really it. And then once that's done, once I graded it and color edge it, I then shuffle it into my stream again so that that basically before I used to have my depth, which was like this, which was ungraded. And then I did copy my red channel that came from my graded color edge into a brand new Z depth node. I used the copy node for that. The reason I did the brand new ZDEP node is because I want to keep the original one if I still need it. Uh, especially I tend to use the ZDEP node a lot 
uh, to do fog effects, which you're going to see a bit later. So as you can see, now I have my graded Z. My graded Z is nothing more than the red channel of whatever we've done here. And now if I move on a bit further, we then go into the ZD focus node. Now the ZD focus node is going to use, I'm just going to light up the scene here so you can see it a bit more. The ZD focus node is going to use the graded Z node that I've used. Um, I am going to just basically change this to focal plane setup so you can see. So what I am doing here is I'm, I've decided from a photography point of view to have a sharp edge, you know, having the sharp image on the foreground where it's green and then the rest is defocused. Of course, I don't have um, a very, very big depth of field. The reason for that, it's not very defocused because I did not want this scene to look like a little small miniature. The objective of this trailer is to show how gigantic the statues are. It's to show how big they are. So, of course, for, for you to, to show the sense of scale, you have to have uh, very little defocusing on your image. Otherwise, it's going to look like it's really small. And also, not only that, but I tend to, to think that, you know, especially in video games, they, they tend to exaggerate so much the defocusing in depth of field. It's just ridiculous. So you have to kind of try to ground whatever effect you're doing in photography. And that's what I try to do. And I kind of start looking at a shot like this and think about, OK, so if these columns are 20 meters high or maybe they are 30 meters high and if I bring in a a, you know a red camera into this cave and i decide to pick up my ca red camera and put you know a, a, a 25 millimeter lens into it and i decide to put an f-stop of 2 or 2.2 what kind of depth of field would i have maybe because it was so dark maybe i've pushed it into an f-stop of 1.8 maybe but tends to be that usually you know you don't have directed photographies pushing the depth of field so much so could be a you know, a 2.2 f-stop or a 2.8 f-stop, something like that. So if you have a 2.8 f-stop, you usually don't have uh, an extreme depth of field. We're not talking about an f1 or an f1.2. My biggest advice to all of you as a compositor is just get a camera and take a lot of pictures because that's when you take the pictures that you learn all these things, you know. But again, here I am rambling again. I'm so sorry. I'm rambling and rambling and rambling. Just keep talking and talking. And so that is it for this week. Uh, next week, we are going to continue with part three, where we are going to talk about more in detail uh, of things like the motion blur vectors. We are also going to talk about atmospherics. We're going to talk about some of the volume ray effects that we've made. Also, the use of 2D elements inside the composite to make it a bit more realistic. And of course, we have to finish off with all the color correction and grading that was done at the very end of the composite. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. And as always, subscribe to my channel, Hugo's Desk. Follow me on Twitter at Hugo C. Guerra. And I hope to see you guys very soon. Thank you so much for watching.